Olá, meninos e meninas, eu sou o Teacher Gus. Eu sou a Mad Hawks. E nós vamos continuar aqui com a série de entrevistas depois do David Crane e do Gary Kitchen. Hoje nós temos a honra, o prazer de entrevistar aqui o Steve Cartwright, que é o criador do Frostbite. Né? Frostbite que... O jogo do tapete. É, a Hawks chama assim, eu chamo como gelinho, né? Mas cada um tem uns nomes diferentes aí, né? Pra chamar. Mas ele não é só o criador do Frostbite. Ele também criou uh, o clássico Mega Mania e muitos outros jogos que nós vamos comentar aí durante a entrevista. Então, olá, Mr. Cartwright. Seja muito bem-vindo. Well, hello. It's a, it's a real, real pleasure to be here and, uh, and a real honor, in fact, uh, to think that the work that we did all those years ago, 30, 35 years ago, is still uh, still considered relevant still have people uh, playing the games and enjoying them that uh, that's great it's a, it is a real honor thank you Olá Steve você pode falar pra gente um pouco sobre o jogo do tapete Frostbite Qual foi a inspiração I found something sir oh good grief man that's the great Frostbite Bailey against all odds he builds his igloo by leaping treacherous moving ice What? He faces one fearsome predator after another. What? In a grueling race to keep from freezing. He didn't make it, did he? Help me stand him up. Bear! I think he wants a beer, sir. I think he said bear. bear. Frostbite for the Atari 2600. Designed by Steve Cartwright for Activision. Yeah, with names like uh, Popsicle and, and Game of Rugs, you must be talking about Frostbite, probably. Probably my favorite game that I worked on at Activision. You know, a lot of people, even, you know, like I said, 30, 35 years ago, people come up to me and say, oh, my favorite game was Mega Mania or, or Sequest. Uh, Frostbite came out kind of at the end of the, uh, the 2600 era, so not as many people got to play that. Uh, and so not as many people, you know, consider it their favorite game, but uh, but I certainly do. It's, it's funny that... Um, The one thing, it probably took me more time to tune that game than any, any game I ever did. And the, the one innovation I came up with that I'm, I'm really proud of is that, uh, as you notice, as the game gets faster, the controls get more sensitive. So as the game gets better, you feel like you're getting better along with it. And eventually it gets to the point where things are moving so quickly on screen that it just becomes a blur. Uh, but because the controls uh, are faster as well, the sensitivity of the control has gone way up, you're able to keep up with the game. And uh, if you're watching somebody play, it's almost impossible to, to watch because it is just a blur. But if you're actually playing it at that high speed, you can uh, you know, kind of zone out and defocus your eyes and, and almost play by feel. And, uh, it's, and a lot of work went into tuning that. And uh, you know, I think we got it right. The inspiration for Frostbite. Uh, well, again, this was a long time ago, 30, 35 years. I don't actually remember that much about it. Uh, I do know that um, it came out about the same time as a game called Qbert. And in Qbert, there was a character jumping around on a, on a structure, and every time he landed, the square that he landed on turned color. And everybody thought, well, Frostbite was based on Qbert. Well, well no, actually, no, it wasn't. Uh, Uh, Frostbite was finished before I ever saw Qbert. Uh, I think the inspiration was actually uh, was Frogger. I remember I had a great time playing Frogger, but with Frogger, as you remember, you got to the other side of the river and, and that was it. Well, I thought, wouldn't it be interesting if you had to go to the other side of the river and back again and keep, keep crossing the river over and over? Um, I didn't want to do a river, so my first attempt was actually... Um, You were a rocks on a, a bed of lava, on a lava river. But, uh, you know, the colors were somewhat, somewhat problematic. It, you know, dark, black for the rocks and, and bright red for the lava didn't quite work out. Uh, the other problem was that, you know, there were no, it was impossible to have any creatures popping out of the lava because they, they wouldn't survive. So, the, so because of the color issue and the, the need for creatures uh, other than the, the main character, uh, we changed it to uh, water and ice flows and um and that's uh, that's how the game evolved and then uh turning the ice color well that was just a, a way to keep track of which ice you had jumped on so you wouldn't get points for jumping on the same ice over and over 
Steve, e sobre o Mega Mania? O que você pode falar pra gente? Qual foi a inspiração? E o que raios são aqueles, aquelas naves espaciais que passam? Porque muita gente diz que parece que é hambúrguer, outros falam que é pandeiro, etc. Você pode dar a, a, a luz aí pra nós? Oh, Mega Mania, another favorite. Uh... Activision presents Mega Mania, a new video game for your Atari video computer system. One, two, three, four, Mega! Mega Mania is a video nightmare because it's impossible to stop. Designed by Steve Cartwright for Activision. Let me see. We actually used to spend a lot of time at an arcade uh, here in the United States called Chuck E. Cheese. It's kind of a, a, an arcade and pizza parlor for kids started by Nolan Bushnell, the founder of Atari. And uh, we'd go there for lunch three or four times a week. And um, at the time, my favorite game was called Astro Blast, I think. It was a space game. And uh, Mega Mania was, was heavily based on Astro, Astro Blast. Uh, in fact, some of the graphics are very similar. Of course, uh, we only had eight bits, uh, so it was tough. Uh, Uh, and so Astro Blast, uh, the enemy ships were a lot more detailed, and, but uh, mine were somewhat limited by the fact I just had eight bits and one color per ship. But, uh, you know, I think uh, Mega Mania, I think it was a lot more fun to play uh, than the original. So, uh, you know, I'm proud of that. Uh, as far as the, the inspiration for the objects, you know, it's funny, they, they originally were, uh, you were in space, and those were supposed to be spaceships and, and asteroids. And... Uh, But at the time, there seemed to be a proliferation of uh, space games. I mean, everybody had a space game on the market. There was Astro this, Astro that, Laser Blast, Laser Smash. Uh, and so uh, somebody in our marketing department said, let's take a completely different route. Uh, let's get away from the space theme and you know, let's call it Gadzooks, kind of a funny name. And, and we thought, you know, you're onto something. That's, that's not quite the right name, but, but we see where you're headed. And And keep it up, keep going in that direction. And, and they came back and they said, okay, look, what if you're in space, you fall asleep at the controls and you have a nightmare. You fall asleep on a full stomach and you have a nightmare of all this food coming at you. And so it'll be, uh, instead of spaceships, we'll say they're flying hamburgers. And instead of asteroids, we'll call them uh, giant potatoes or whatever, spinning dice. Uh, I forget all the, the different things. But it was it actually uh, somebody in marketing came up with that. And uh, that was very clever. They did a great job. And, 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 and thus, the, you know, the name Megamania, uh, to take it away from the typical space genre. E o que, que você pode falar pra gente sobre o Black Attack depois do jogo da comida flutuante no espaço? É, vem essa, esse jogo de escovar os dentes? Teve algum patrocínio de alguma empresa meio conhecida? Como foi isso? Oh, oh thank you very intensely, of course. Wrong. I need Plaque Attack by Activision for the Atari 2600. Your pearly white space and onslaught of flying junk food. Holy molars, it's intense. But you've got laser action toothpaste. <gasps> One more for the tooth fairy. Tooth fairy? No, I'm just a TV repair man. Repair woman. I do a repair fairy. Plaque Attack, another zany idea from Steve Cartwright for Activision. Plaque Attack, yeah. What, uh... Probably my least favorite game. Uh, that was a case where uh, another designer had been working on something and it was scheduled for release. And it got close to release time and uh, the game just wasn't happening. It just it wasn't any fun and it, there was nothing really there to, to ship. And uh, so they said, Steve, can you help us out? And I think I had like three weeks. And so I so, said, well, what if I took the code out of Mega Mania and kind of turned it upside down and put a top and a bottom into the game. And, and I don't know where I came up with the idea of um, shooting food in a mouth. There might have been an arcade game that has something to do with teeth. Or, you know, again, it was, it was so long ago it's hard to remember, but uh, no, it wasn't sponsored by any dental association or any toothpaste company, but it was just something that was thrown together as quickly as possible. Like I said, I think it was about three weeks and uh, you know, it was okay, not my, not my best effort. But uh, I'm glad that people, some people still like it. 
de todas as suas criações, você teve algum favorito? Tem algum que assim toca mais fundo no seu, na sua emoção? Do I have any favorites? Uh, boy, you know, I, I put... It was so hard to do. Those games were so tough to make. So much work went into them. And I remember, it's funny, Dave and I, Dave Crane and I still talk about this. The story one time I came into work after being up all night trying to scrunch a few bytes out of the code to make it fit into a 4K cartridge. <laughs> and I said to Dave, I said, you know, there's only a few people in the world that actually realize how hard this was to do because uh, there was only a few, uh, few of us that could do it and knew how to do it. Uh, it was incredibly difficult. But each game, you know, I, I, I took pride in, in each game. Barnstorming obviously was my first game. And uh, it's funny, I, my first day at work coming home, I, I saw a, a biplane flying through the sky pulling an advertising banner. And that's how I got the idea for Barnstorming. Prepare for adventure. Prepare for Barnstorming by Activision, the thrilling new video game you play on your Atari video computer system. Zoom through barns. Soar over windmills. It's seat of the pants flying in all its glory. <coughs> sure, it's a tough game, but somebody's got to play it. Don't miss Barnstorming by Activision. Playing at a store near you. Second game, Mega Mania, was technically incredibly difficult because you had uh, objects passing through other objects. Uh, Alien ships passing through the player ship and, and missiles passing through the, the rows of alien ships and they were shooting missiles at you and everything had to pass through each other without glitching. And so technically that was probably the, one of the toughest games. Uh, very proud of that, the way it turned out. Uh, the playability is, is still great. Uh, Sequest, I think uh, Sequest wasn't as tough technically but just the rules, <laughs> you know. I remember I, I sat there and I got the basic display up and running in a couple of weeks and sat there playing with the, the, trying to come up with the rules for months and months. And, <laughs> and one time Dave walked by my desk and he looked at the screen and said, oh, well, you pick up the divers. When you pick up all the divers, you surface. And uh, there's an oxygen tank and that's, your, that's like your timer. <laughs> and really it all came together in about 30 seconds. Neptune challenges you to Sequest by Activision. With the Atari 2600, behold, Sequest. Your submarine must help stranded divers escape hungry sharks. Foolish mortals. Check your air supply and beware, evil pirates abound. I think I hear your tiny divers calling out to you. Help. Help. Sequest. Steve Cartwright does it again for Activision. Uh, so the one thing great about Activision in those days is we all worked together, we all helped out each other, we were all the main uh, test resource on everybody's game, uh, and so that that was a that was a team effort. Um, Plaque Attack, I mentioned, you know, probably not my favorite game, but it was done in such a short period of time that uh, I, I got to take pride in that effort. And then of course Frostbite, probably the the game that I spent the most time tuning. Uh, and I think to this day has the best playability. So, you know, I'm incredibly proud of all of them. Uh, there's one other that I take pride in. Uh, uh, and in fact, Dave and I joke about this. He doesn't, he, sometimes he says he doesn't remember, but um, we had just come back from uh, CES, the Consumer Electronics Show in Chicago. And we'd taken a break at night and we'd gone to see, I think it was The Empire Strikes Back, the first Star Wars sequel. And we came back to work and I'd been trying a couple different game ideas and nothing was really happening. And I thought, wait a minute, we just saw one of the coolest movies ever. It's a sequel of Star Wars. Why don't we do a sequel of a game? And I said, we'll call it Pitfall 2. And instead of going sideways to the jungle, he'll go vertical down through these caves. And everybody looked at me and said, sequel? You can't do a sequel of a video game. That's, that's ridiculous. Our job is to come up with something new every time. I go, no, really, it'd be great, and just, just give me a chance. And, and so I worked on a display, and I got it up and running. I had the character run, you know, dropping down through these caverns. And Dave looked at it and said, oh, my gosh, this is, this is kind of a cool idea. Uh, he took it over because uh, he was probably the only one that could technically pull it off, um, and it required actually a, a special chip. 
he designed a special chip to do that game as well. So I give him credit for that. But uh, I think I came up with the first, uh, the, the concept at least, for the first video game sequel ever done. Como que era trabalhar lá na Activision, na Activision, nos anos 80? Era divertido, era legal, era estressante? Como que era? Uh, again, that's, uh, that's, what, 36 years ago now, I guess? Uh, you know, it was, it was so different. Um, remember, this was brand new, and there was no, nothing that ever had been done like this. I mean, video games were such a brand new form of entertainment. And there was so much work that went into each one of these games. It was amazing. And we all worked together. It was a tiny room in the back. And we all sat on uh, stools, like workbench stools. And we had workbenches. Uh, and um, it, was, it was tough work. But we, we were together all day. We all went to lunch together. You know, we all traveled together. Went to the, the shows together. Basically spent every minute together. Almost, uh, almost like a rock group back in the 60s. Uh, but it was a fun time. It was an exciting time. Uh, unfortunately, it, it, it ended all too quickly. But I still have fond memories, still have um, made friendships that last till this day. Uh, so, yeah, it was, uh, it was really special. I, I'm not sure that something like that's ever going to happen again. E hoje em dia você ainda costuma jogar? Você joga jogos hoje em dia? Well, you have to understand that when I grew up, there was no such thing as a video game. And so... None of us actually grew up playing games, uh, unlike the kids of today. So, uh, you know, when I started in the business, we didn't play games. Um, and, you know, in a 30-year career, I actually never did play games. I, you know, I played them for research. Uh, if I was working on uh, the early Activision games, we went to the arcade to play for research. Uh, when I went to Electronic Arts some years later, you know, I played golf games uh, for research because I was doing golf games at Electronic Arts, uh, even though at the time I didn't even play golf. Uh, some years later, I was working on a uh, kind of a, a kid's uh, on, online world. Uh, you know, I take that back. There is one game that I've played uh, in my free time, and that was uh, Animal Crossing uh, by Nintendo. G great game. Um, uh, and I hear it's coming out on mobile soon, so I'll, I'll be excited to play that. But uh, no, I, I really have never played any games for, for entertainment, uh, just, just for work, just for research. Como que você vê a indústria dos jogos hoje em dia? Well, I mean, it's obviously a lot different. Um, back when we were, uh, we were doing it, uh, before anybody else was doing it, it was all about innovation. It was all about trying to make something that was really fun, trying to give uh, the player the most fun we could for their hard-earned entertainment dollar. Uh, and we worked hard at it. And um, today, unfortunately, it's, it's, it's probably more about money, I think. I remember probably, was it seven or eight years ago, Zynga came out with the concept of uh, player analytics, measuring what players did, and microtransactions, and trying to maximize uh, every penny you could. And all of a sudden, games were measured not by how fun they were, but by how many cents they could make, you know, per player or per thousand players, you know, per unit of time. And it, it became less about entertainment and more about business, almost like a stock trading. So, you know, I actually got out of the games business a couple of years ago. Uh, it, it just wasn't fun anymore for me. Uh, back when I was in it, uh, it took a large company like an Activision or an Electronic Arts because uh, the cost of development the, the development systems themselves were expensive, you know, thousands of dollars of equipment to make these games. And once you made the game, the, the code had to be put on a disc or on a CD that had to be shipped to a manufacturer. And the manufacturer had to make discs and put them in boxes and ship them to stores. So it took a big company to do all that, to have the infrastructure to do all that. You know, nowadays you can, uh, you know, a couple, a couple guys on their kitchen table or in their spare bedroom can make a game. Uh, using any MacBook and, a, and an iPhone. And so the need to have a big company behind you is, is, is really gone, uh, unless you're talking about some of these budgets with licenses that, that have budgets in the millions of dollars, you know, far more than we ever dreamed about spending on a game. Uh, but it is different. Um, like I said, I, I'd gotten out of the games business a couple of years ago, but then I ran into a, a, an individual a couple of years ago who had an idea 
for a new type of casino game. And uh, casino games are not necessarily anything I ever played before, but his take was unique, and he needed somebody to design, design something based on a patent he had. And so I've been working on that and having some fun. And we've gotten back to you know, trying to figure out what makes a game fun uh, over what makes a game profitable. Uh, and also, you know, the new uh, instant messenger games that are coming out on Facebook, I think are getting back to those days where you, you worry about uh, uh, ensuring that the player has fun rather than how much money they're spending. So that's exciting. And I think, uh, I, don't, I don't know that we're there yet, but I'm sure that uh, AR and VR will have some impact. Right now it's probably more hardcore, hardcore audience. But uh, I'd love to see that become more casual and open it up to uh, the, the entire family. Um, you know, games will always be around. You know, what was fun 30 years ago is still fun today, and, and it'll still be fun 30 years from now. So uh, the, the, that's an exciting part that uh, still holds true. Você gosta de remakes? Quem sabe a gente pode ter um Frostbite, um Sea Quest do futuro aí? Am I a fan of uh, remakes? Uh, well, as I mentioned, I think uh, Pitfall 2, uh, uh, the concept I had for Pitfall 2, again, I think, you know, might be the world's first video game sequel. Uh, prior to that, uh, you know, I did um, uh, Mega Mania, which was very closely based on an arcade game, Astro Blast. Uh, uh, Sequest was actually based largely on Defender. And uh, in that case, Defender, you remember in the arcades, Defender was a, a space game. Sequest was an undersea game. So that may be the world's first example of uh, what today what's called reskinning uh, a game. So uh, you know, basically the same game, uh, same playability, but different graphics. Um, later on, I did a, when the Commodore came along, I did a game called Hacker and followed that up with Hacker 2 which was uh, another sequel. Uh, and it's funny, I remember I was working on Hacker 3 when the company said, oh, we think this sequel thing has gone, gone long enough, gone on long enough, so why don't you try something different? And so I should have stuck to my guns, I should have stuck to my instinct. Because, um, you know, look at, look at where we are, you know, um, Metal Gear Solid, what is that, the version 10 or something? Uh, sports games, um, you know, Madden Football or, or EA's Football. Uh, that's going on, was it, a 20-year anniversary, something like that. So, you know, sequels and follow-ons are the, are the core of this industry, what make up the core of the industry. Uh, in terms of a remake, that might be interesting, although uh, without this, the hardware, you know, the, the, one of the things that made the Atari so, so fun to play was that joystick, <laughs> you know, just, you know, that big joystick you had to hold in your hand and, and turn in one button. I mean, how much easier can it get than that? And so... Uh, I think a lot of the playability of those games was actually the hardware involved. Um, it'd be a lot different playing, uh, playing Frostbite or, 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 or Sequest or Mega Mania on your iPhone. Uh, maybe it's possible, I don't know, but uh, if somebody wants to try, you know, uh, you know, I'm all for it. Você tem alguma mensagem, alguma palavra de encorajamento que você possa dar para os novos designers de jogos de hoje em dia? Well, as I mentioned, it's, uh, in, in many ways it's a lot easier today because you don't have to have the thousands of dollars worth of equipment and the backing of a, a, a huge corporation behind you. You can make a game on your iPhone. Uh, you can make a game using HTML5 that can play in your browser. Um, so don't be too worried about technical limitations. Remember, we were, we were doing things in 8 bits with a relatively slow processor and 256 bytes of RAM, 4K of ROM, uh, very little memory, uh, very little sound effects or colors or graphics, and they're still fun to play. So sometimes uh, technical limitations can actually be your friend because uh, you have to design within those constraints and try to, try to squeeze the fun out of, uh, of something that seems very limited. Um, in terms of design, So number one, don't, you know, don't worry about if you have limited technology because that's, that's no excuse. Uh, um, in terms of design, whatever you design, make sure it's simple. You know, make sure it's as simple as you can and then cut it in half, cut the, sim cut the complexity in half. Um, there was a designer that once told me, uh, uh, he was a respected systems designer, an economics designer who worked on Cityville for, for Zynga. 
One thing he told me was avoid arbitrary rules. You know, don't have a bunch of uh, rules in your game to try to explain uh, something that's overly complicated. Just strip it down. Get, get to the bare uh, essentials of what makes it fun. If it's a basketball game, make sure that the act of throwing the ball is fun because that's the most important thing that you do in the game. That's the thing you'll do the most often in the game. Uh, if it's running and jumping, uh, don't worry about all the things around the game. Just make sure that the running and the jumping is as fun as you can possibly make it. So get down to the essence of what the game is about. Stick with it. And, and don't worry so much about attracting new players. Make sure that the people that are playing your game, uh, worry about them. Worry about their current players. Make the game as fun as you can for the people that already like it. And, uh, and you'll do fine. E hoje em dia, Steve, o que, é que você faz? Well, uh, as I mentioned, I, I got out of the games business a few years ago and actually uh, started working at enterprise software companies. And, uh, um, even though I was a game designer, really, I, I always considered myself a usability designer. You know, even when I was working on a game like basketball or golf, I didn't invent the rules to those sports. And so it was my job to make them fun to play. And that's, that's usability. So you, usability UX, user experience, UI design, user interface. Um, that's really what I've done all these years. Um, even before anybody knew what a UI or UX designer was, uh, we were doing it, making games. So I got into enterprise software a few years ago and I, I was lucky enough, I worked on a, uh, a large a real-time collaboration system that was being used by Lucasfilm to, uh, to map out their new Star Wars movies. Um, these days I got involved with a startup of, of some guys, uh, ex-DreamWorks and ex-Pixar guys, trying to make a cloud-based animation solution. And so that's a lot of fun. Um, additionally, I, I, as I mentioned, I ran into somebody a few years ago who had an idea for a casino game. He has a patent on a new type of uh, uh, a gaming mechanism for casinos. And so I've been working on that with them, and, and uh, that looks like it's coming together. And so uh, very soon you may be seeing a, you know, a game in the casinos next to the slot machine that, uh, that uh, you know, is a Steve Cartwright design. So I'm looking forward to that. Então nós vamos ficando por aqui. Muito obrigada, senhor Steve, por responder nossas perguntas com tanta boa vontade. Sim, nessa terceira entrevista, agora o senhor Steve Cartwright trouxe para nós as informações do Frostbite, do Sequest, Black Attack. Mega Mania, enfim, muito bom ter esse contato com o pessoal aqui do Brasil. Lembre-se, você que está assistindo aí, você pode colocar seus comentários aqui, porque ele vai ler depois, tá? Ele vai receber o link aí e vai assistir o, o vídeo e vai ler os comentários. Então, se você tem alguma mensagem para o Steve Cartwright, manda a brasa aqui embaixo. Steve, valeu! Até a próxima! Bom, well, again, thank you for having me. It's, it's been a lot of fun. It's, uh, it's, it's fun to, to go back and think back about what happened all those years ago. And uh, like I said, I appreciate the fact that uh, people are still playing the games, still having fun. You know, it's an honor. And uh, good luck with your projects. Uh, and, then, uh, and feel free to contact me anytime. Thank you.